There's never a good amount of damp for a driver's seat, but this has got a touch more damp than I would really be happy with. Furious Driving, proud to be supported by Diamond Bright, protecting, cleaning and caring for the Furious fleet and for yours with 10% off using code FD10. Follow the links in the description below. Hello and welcome to Furious Driving. And today we're driving what is a very rare car and in fact is about to become a little bit rarer because when I get back from this test drive, this car is going for scrap which is kind of sad, but also kind of not. This is a 1997, I think, Honda Shuttle. You might think this is a strange car to review, but this does answer a couple of questions. What if I love my Honda Accord, but I really want to take a wardrobe or a rugby team with me? And more sensibly, what if I need a six or seven seater that is practical, reliable, easy to keep on the road, apart from spare parts, and doesn't cost the earth to buy? This is the answer, the shuttle. It is, however, quite rare these days. Looking around researching this video, there were two for sale in the UK of this generation. There have been a number of generations, of course. The first shuttle was massively different from this particular car. It was based on the Civic, so it was a lot smaller, and it had that fantastic early 80s square styling. It was basically someone had taken a Civic and pulled it very tall. It looks ridiculous and I want one. <laughs> it came out in 1983 and it was replaced by this in 1995. This though moved up a league. They replaced the underpinnings of the venerable Civic with the Accord, so it's an awful lot bigger. And if you think how big a Civic was back in the 90s, then you really get an idea of how much space has been squeezed into this vehicle because that was a long, long car, long and low. Whereas this is, well, long and tall and quite wide and there is room for everything. The only thing I'm finding really, there's a bit of elbow bashage going on on my right arm, a bit like driving a Defender, but uh, obviously a lot more comfortable and a lot quieter despite the, I think, blowing exhaust. Right, so looking around the outside of the shuttle, imagine you had an Accord and you wanted one that was just a lot taller and just bulkier. It's about four and a half meters of very uninspiring metal. There's just really not a lot on first glance to make it stand out in any way, shape or form as an exciting piece of design. A lot of MPVs of the 90s had clever doors, that kind of thing. This is none of that big five doors. They are absolutely enormous doors. It's like two pace long London taxi doors. Absolutely huge. We have also got big little quarter light windows fixed in the corner so you can see out. And up here, like on the Honda Civics that we get at the Honda Rover R8, we've got a little antenna that slides down into the A post, which is a cute feature. Unfortunately, it is broken off on this particular one and surrounded by mold. Never mind. Around the front of the car, it looks like a typical Honda face, very much a Honda Accord, but slightly inflated. They've shortened the bonnet and inflated the nose to give it a weird kind of Honda presence. But it's such a big car, such a short bonnet, lots of interior space. Now, fans of a wonky wiper are gonna adore this. It's got clap hand wipers, which in the 1990s was a very exciting feature. I say very exciting, it was a feature. And that was barely a feature, it's just a thing. Under the bonnet, there is literally an engine. Four cylinders, 2.2 litres, later on as a 2.3, which made exactly the same power, 150 horsepower. And it's kind of about all I've got to say about it. It is, quite frankly, an engine. What is quite interesting is how far it goes underneath the scuttle. If you've got to get to that stuff under there, you are burying yourself underneath those interesting wipers. But you don't buy a car like this for the outside and the looks. You buy it for the practicality and the cabin. And that is where we come in in spades in this car. We have got all the comfort, all the practicals, all in one place. Now, interestingly, it is a very Japanese layout in here. They've not really made any accommodation for European or American markets. So we have got a column shift here on the left-hand side to go through all of your gears. Hang on, let's put it on there. So we actually do have a light-up indicator showing what gear we're in. Park, reverse, neutral, drive four, drive three, two, and of course, one. We've got the same stalks we find on a Rover R8 and all the Hondas through the 90s, which are wonderful things, but interestingly, they are the wrong way around. So we've got our wipers on the left, and we've got our, our lights and indicators on the right, which is obviously the Japanese way around doing things. It's a really interesting dashboard. One enormous speedometer uh, going up to 125 miles an hour. The top speed in this thing is 114, apparently. But the indicators in there really are very much more about the absolute basics more than about any kind of performance driving. So enormous speedometer, 
big fuel gauge, big temperature gauge, a couple of warning lights, of course our gear indicator, and then over on the left hand side, our door warning thing, because if you've got 19 children in the car, you need to know if one of them is trying to sneak out. Above that we have an absolutely vast tea shelf, but you knew you would do because we are in the kind of car that's gonna spend its entire life driving to and from school and drama club and sports club and sitting in the car park waiting for children to finish activities and that kind of thing. So you want a ton of practicality. We've got tweeters over in the corner for decent audio quality. We've got an airbag tucked in the top. It looks like a bit of an afterthought considering how late this car evolved. Underneath that, we've got another shelf for storage. We've got air vents up and down. So we've got so one pointing up at the window all the time, one variable to point at people. In the center, we've got triple air vents. Again, one fixed, two movable. We've got fog light, hazard lights, rear screen heater, blanking plate, and of course, the same little digital clock we found in virtually every Japanese car for 25 years. Beneath that, we have a very large, expansive dashboard. Not much going on on the passenger side. In the center, we've got a very standard arrangement of heater and air conditioning controls. The slider for the fan, the slider for temperature, which would probably be there. I think, I think it's pushed to hot, which is lucky today. Underneath that, we've got a single din radio. This is an, an old Pioneer one that's been popped in there. Oops. And apparently, comes on without any lights as soon as you plug it in, which explains why it was uh, popped forward. A little slot for stuff, an ashtray, a lighter, a storage bin, That's so much practical. Uh, we've got a with button you can push, which presumably does something, adjustable height on the steering wheel, we've got adjustable height on the headlights in case we've got a big heavy load in there, a blanking thing, another little storage thing. The door's super tall and reasonably practical. A lot of plastic going on. We've got one touch window on the drivers. We've got electric mirrors, a huge square thing they used for so, so long. All four electric windows, of course. Not very big door pocket, surprisingly, but we do have those warning lights to say the door is open because, you know, kids will open doors and not tell anyone. And we've got extreme rust. Interestingly, we've got a massive doorstep to kind of climb up across here. So let's take a quick look at these seats because they are absolutely wonderful armchairs that you just sink into. We've got these fold down armrests to turn them into like captain's chairs. Up above, we've got lots and lots of headroom. But let's look in the back because this is where the excitement and practicality continues. Now, going through this absolutely enormous rear door, which has got a door pull, a door pocket, and a cup holder. I'm going to ignore whatever the hell that is down there and not touch it. We've got a little light in the door, we've got a speaker in the door, electric windows. But stepping inside, because this is a choice of a six or a seven seater, we've got a vast, vast, vast amount of space. If you remember the Honda Accord was a long car, but didn't use it particularly practically in saloon form. This uses every millimeter of it. So huge flat floor. Think an EV kind of floor, but without the higher level of floor because of the battery underneath. So this is literally step through from the front because the column shift is there. If one person's driving and a kid in the back is playing up, the person in the passenger seat can climb straight through from there and give the kid in the back who's being naughty a thick ear. Oh, interestingly, in case the kids want to smoke, put, make sure you put the smoking child on the left-hand side because this one has got an ashtray in it. I suspect possibly that should be one on that side as well. Now these seats are interesting because not only are they incredibly squishy and have this lovely kind of very muted 90s fabric pack, they have little handles on them and they pull every which way but loose. So they can fold forward and by pulling that little tag down there, they fold forward as well. So you turn this entire thing into an absolutely enormous van. So it is monstrously practical. They even have little hydraulic rams on there in order to make the whole situation far easier. Now entering the bootle area. It is very, very long, especially with those seats folded down. It's not too wide because we've got a bit of incursion of storage areas on the left, I'll show you in a moment, and the spare wheel mounted up here on the right. It's a space saver spare wheel, but it still does take a bit of space. Also, because it has got fold out seats in the back, which, oh God, I don't want to touch this. They are actually dripping. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna climb into those seats, but uh, yeah, because they, these seats are here, it does mean there's a bit of a rise up in the floor of the boots. It's a slightly strange shape, but a lot of space. We do, of course, also have the seat belts for those rear seats. We've got a cubby area there. We've got a, a lidded box just there for your tools. And you've got cup holders left and right as well. So there is an absolute gallon of practicality and usefulness in the back of this car.
Now, under the bonnet, we've got that 150 horsepower, 2.2 litre Honda Straight 4, and married to this automatic gearbox, which I think is a four speed as well. And that was basically the only option until they replaced the uh, 2.2 with a 2.3. There was no diesel and no manual, because it was always designed to have this big walk-through area in the center to make lots and lots of space. But it was never about driving dynamics or speed. Not to 60s, just under 12 seconds apparently. Top speed's 114. MPG, not drastically impressive at 26, but Honda four cylinders never do seem to be that impressive when it comes to that kind of thing. This thing really isn't built for speed, it is 100% built for comfort. It's got all wishbone suspension all the way around, so it's fully independent and lovely and squishy and soft, and it doesn't really get nicer than this. And that is really what this car is all about, it's ultimate practicality and ultimate comfort. If you're running errand after errand, school, kids clubs, goodness knows what else, back and forth, short journeys, long journeys, and lots and lots of sitting in the car, waiting for kids to finish doing things, waiting for partners and parents and anything else, even long holidays and road trips maybe if you're doing family wagon stuff, this really is absolutely ideal. If you've got five children or something, well, I'm not sure why you'd want to do such a thing, then uh, again, it's perfect. Now I know some of you get absolutely triggered if I do a car that's not minty mint pristine and most of the cars I feature on here are really really nice. They've either come from car dealers or museums or owners who cherish them. This particular thing has been a tradesman's, like a decorator's work truck for the last couple of years and has been shown all the love that something like that would be shown. So the fact that it's still rolling and driving and starting and shifting everything as easy and correctly as it is, is a testament to how tough these things are. Let's face it, Hondas don't really break very much. And this is doing a bang up job of keeping on going, 163,000 miles. And I mean, there's never a good amount of damp for a driver's seat, but this has got a touch more damp than I would really be happy with. But you know, we, we, can, we can live with that. We have clean trousers pushing 30 years old, and it is still, I'm not gonna say like new, that would be ridiculous, but it is, is it as much fun as a sports car? No. Is it as entertaining in a weird kind of goofy way as a Defender? No, but if you need to move stuff and people and things, you really can't go wrong with this. 1,500 quid buys you a car like this. This thing, I imagine going for scrap value is something like three or 400 pounds. It does still have MOT on it as well. Looking back in time to the 80s and the 90s and into the early noughties of course, if you needed to move stuff, the MPV was king. They were everywhere. Nothing signaled, I've given up on life and now I shuttle my kids from place to place like an MPV in your drive. These days, that place has been taken by the blander end of the SUV market. So yeah, I'm not gonna name names, but we know what we're talking about. And to that end, rather sadly, because these are so much more practical and useful and drive so much better than SUVs, it really is a shame that MPVs have more or less died out. But they've died out to the extent that when I was trying to research this video, there was nothing on the internet. I found barely a holding page on Wikipedia. I found a second page which said about this specific model, fortunately, but with a lot of padding and scant information. And that was written in 2007. This really is the car that time forgot. Which is a shame because, okay, it's huge and it's thirsty and it's bland, but then so are most SUVs. And this thing drives so much better than 90% of them. So this is my advice today. If you've got less than 2,000 pounds, you need to shift a lot of people in pretty high level of comfort with a lot of cup holders, then this, the Honda Shuttle, is the car for you. The only problem you're gonna find is actually finding one because there really aren't any left. I suspect if this was an enthusiast type car in this condition and it was going to go for scrap, there would be a queue of people lining up to rescue it. And I'd be lining up to rescue it. As it is, it's a big old bus, no one loves them, which is a shame because it's very useful indeed. Anyway, if you've enjoyed this little ride out in this, I'm going to say lovely, okay, it's filthy and it's damp and my trousers need changing because I'm soggy now. Honda Shuttle. Please hit like and subscribe and join us again next time driving something completely different and next time it really will be different to this. I've just realised we didn't do a horn test. Yeah that's um, an honest last legs pop unfortunately. <laughs>